Thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you very much, Stefan and Lionel, for organizing this excellent event. It's my first time joining this Bayesiana Lab conference. I hope it's the first time many others. So the topic is from, for me today is cross-examination with Bayesian networks. And I will outline a formal model using Bayesian network, our common interest here in this event to think about conceptually and theoretically about cross-examination. I want to start with a metaphor that has captured the imagination of lawyers and also judges and perhaps the general public. And this is the metaphor of cross-examination as the greatest legal engine ever invented for the discovery of truth. This expression goes back to the Slav scholar John Wigmore in his voluminous treatise on the law of evidence, the beginning of the 20th century. And this metaphor has been repeated several times in numerous court opinions, especially in the United States. Here we see a citation of it in a U.S. Supreme Court in 1999. Of course, this is a metaphor and we might have several reasons to doubt it. So I want to mention a few of them. We not talk about memory manipulation and the work of Elizabeth, the psychologist Elizabeth Loftus. Here I have a screenshot of one of her earlier papers back in 1974, Reconstruction of Automobile Destruction. So what Loftus and her colleague Palmer did, they gave a number of experimental subjects video to watch. This video uh, depicted various car crashes at different speeds. And then they asked subjects to watch the same video, slightly different questions. They asked how fast were the car going when they hit one another? How fast were they going when they smashed into one another? How fast were they going when they bumped into one another? And it turned out that the answers about what the subject acted, about what they saw in the videos were very different depending on the words that we use in this question. So we can be led to give different accounts of what happened depending on the leading questions of your subject. Another point of being skeptical about the metaphor of cross-examination of the greatest legal engine is witness coaching. You know, the lawyer can sit with their client and they can rehearse how the process of cross-examination by the other party's lawyer is going. They can agree on the answers to give. And so the process of cross-examination could look like more a rehearsed and staged event rather than a live examination and search for the truth. And this point, among others, was at the center of an article that was quite influential by the historian and legal scholars of evidence law, John Langman, in 1985, the German advantage in civil procedure, in which he criticized the adversarial method of trial in the Anglo-American legal world. So he said, if we had deliberately set out to find means of impairing the reliability of witness testimony, we could not have done much better than the existing system of having partisan prepare witnesses in advance of trial and cross-examine them. On the other hand, there might be good, there might be reasons to be optimistic about cross-examination as this engine for the discovery of truth. And in surveying the literature, I just want to point out this interesting article by a legal scholar's economist, William Sankirico. So she writes, the special difficulty for the fabricating witness of maintaining consistency and detail when facing unanticipated questions is crucial to ensuring that successful testimony is a more difficult enterprise for the insincere witness. The point of this, of this quotation and the larger article is that, yes, we are subject to content limitation, memory manipulation, and other forms of content limitation, selective attention, for example. But this cognitive limitation could actually be the engine that allows cross-examination to work. How, if we compare the sincere witness with the insincere witness, both of them will have, during cross-examination, provide a precise, detailed, and consistent story about what they saw, presumably. But the cognitive load of the insincere witness will be much greater than the cognitive load of the sincere witness, precisely because we have cognitive limitation, limits in computational power, limits in our ability to remember things, and limits in our ability to see the connection between things. 
So it would be much harder for the insincere witness to provide a specific detail and consistent picture of the facts. And so it would be more likely to prove the insincere witness wrong. At least this is some curious insight here. So the debate here that I briefly sketched, we start with a metaphor by Wigmore on the engine for the discovery of truth. Then we have this cautionary chance by Landman pointing out, among other things, witness coaching as a potential factor that undermines the truth-seeking function of cross-examination. This is buttressed by a lot of findings in psychology. I haven't gone through all of them, of course, memory manipulation, selective attention, and several others. But there is perhaps, on the other hand, hope because those very cognitive limitations that might undermine our, the reliability of our testimony might also be exactly the reason why cross-examination is an engine that can go and then uh, gets us at the truth. So why am I telling you all this and where are we headed in this talk? So I'm telling you all this because on a general point, I think the question whether cross-examination is an engine for the truth is an interesting question in its own way, both theoretically and uh, practically. But more specifically, my hope is that by modeling cross-examination using Bayesian networks, so offering a more precise model of what examination does and accomplishes, we can put the question of whether cross-examination is an engine for truth discovery on a more clear conceptual footing. So this is an exercise in conceptual clarification. And I should say that's an exercise that philosophers often do. I didn't say that at the beginning, but I'm trained as a philosopher, although my research intersects law, statistics, and probability, but I'm a trained as a philosopher. So you see that kind of probably for better or for worse, reverberate through the talk. Of course, Besides the conceptual modeling, we could also try to tackle the question of cross-examination as an engine for the truth using psychological experiments. We could run experiments under some kind of control condition and see whether cross-examination is an engine for truth or not. But I think even, I'm all in favor of that, of course, but even if we want to pursue that route, we, we will have still to do some conceptual clarification about what kind of variable we want to test and how we want to conceptualize and think of cross-examination. So this work of conceptual ground theory, I think, is important either way. I haven't given you yet a definition of cross-examination, and I, will, I won't give you one, but I think for this purpose, a rough characterization could suffice. So cross-examination is the elicitation of subsidiary evidence or information or fact from a witness by asking probing questions. And it happens at trials, it happens after direct examination. We can identify two roles of cross-examination. One is an interpretative one, and it could be a constructive one. So this subsidiary information of evidence that is elic elicited during cross-examination ensures a fuller understanding of the fact. And then we have a more partisan role, a polemical role of cross-examination, which is that its intended purpose is to weaken or attack the other party's case. And this is perhaps what we're most familiar with, the polemical or partisan role. And this is what I will focus on in modeling attempt, although the interpretative and constructive role is equally important, but I will not talk about it. I think an important distinction at this point to begin our conceptual modeling enterprise is to draw a distinction that is familiar among theorists of argumentation and epistemology, which is the distinction between rebutting and undercutting evidence. So this subsidiary information that is elicited during cross-examination, I, I think can categorize in rebut, categorize in rebutting and undercutting subsidiary information or subsidiary evidence. So let me give you an example of that. And I have here a little graph that is an argumentation graph. So let's suppose we have, a, let's look on the left-hand side of the graph. So we have some supporting evidence, a testimony of a witness. Let's say I saw the defendant run away from the crime seat. And then the prosecution once uses this evidence to establish or at least gives a reason to think that the hypothesis that the defendant was near the crime scene is plausible, like, and that part of the prosecution is, can be attacked in two ways. So the lawyers for the defense can decide to attack heads on the hypothesis itself, 
by providing evidence, subsidiary evidence that rebuts that hypothesis. Let's say another witness who said, look, I was with the defendant at that time. We were having dinner. So that's an alibi testimony. Or the prosecution case can be attacked by undercutting the evidential connection between the supporting evidence and the prosecution hypothesis. For example, by asking further question to the witness, say, you claim you were there, you claim you saw the witness, how far were you, was it dark, were you tired, uh, did you wear glasses, etc. And if you can get some answers from the witness, let's say it was bad, I couldn't see, that would undercut the evidential connection between the testimony and the prosecution hypothesis. So rebutting evidence is is evidence that supports an alternative hypothesis, alternative or incompatible to the hypothesis initially forward, and undercutting evidence is that evidence that weakens or undercuts or blocks the evidential link between the evidence and the hypothesis without necessarily providing support for an alternative hypothesis. We can also, of course, use this distinction to create a much more complex model, and that's always the case in legal cases. So we can think about a chain of inferences from the evidence or the witness testimony to the hypothesis the defendant was near the crime scene and the further inference the defendant was present at the crime scene. We can attack heads on each one of these hypotheses by providing rebutting evidence, or we can undercut or block the evidential link, the evidence, the inferences that are made through this chain of inferences. All right, so being clear, at least roughly speaking, on the distinction between undercutting and rebutting information that is elicited during cross-examination, I want to move on to the modeling with Bayesian uh, network. So I'm going to start with the undercutting side of it. So the Bayesian network model is going to be fairly simple. So we have three nodes. We're going to have a hypothesis node, an evidence node, and then an undercutting node. So the evidence is presumed to bear on the hypothesis, support the hypothesis, and then the undercutting node, you could indicate various kind of conditions, bad visibility, good visibility, the witness being paid by party, etc. We can put constraints on the probability distributions here to capture the idea of undercutting. So the constraint is going to be fairly simple. It basically says that our evidence is stronger whenever the undercutting condition is false compared to when the undercutting condition is true. And we can force that constraints of the network by using the kind of like ratio inequality that I put up there. And then once we do that, we can easily prove intuitive things very straightforwardly. For example, that when we add that an undercutting condition is true, then the probability of our hypothesis goes down, which is what we would expect. Here is an example, more concrete, in the case of a DNA match. Uh, So we have three nodes. M stands for a match. This is an assertion by an expert witness who says, I got a sample from the defendant. I got a sample from the crime scene. And there were some trays, some blood, or some hair, or some saliva. Uh, examine these two samples and they turn out to match. The two carry the same genetic profile. This piece of evidence can be used to support the hypothesis as source, that source hypothesis, the defendant was present at the crime scene of one to be more careful. The defendant is the source of the uh, crime scene trace. And then the third note here is the error note. This is what a defense lawyer might try to push and ask the expert witness, can you tell me how you actually carried out your tests? How did you, how did you handle the samples, et cetera? And the defense lawyer might want to find some kind of error in the lab testing or some handling, et cetera. So if you want to put some numbers here, we can say that if the, if there is no error, then the value of the match, the probability, the incriminating value of the match is pretty high is one over the random match probability, where the random match probability is usually a very low number. It is the probability that even if the defendant is not the source of the trace, it would match anyway, because that's the probability of a coincidental or random match, which is usually a very low number. However, if we add that there is an error, there was an error, and suppose this 
could be discovered during cross-examination, then the match would become essentially worthless evidence. We put 0.5, 0.5 of each one of the conditional probabilities. And then we can write our conditional probability table here pretty straightforwardly. We can do the same with eyewitness. So the model would be exactly the same. Uh, so we have the witness. So the evidence is a W, the witness there. And then one of the undermining condition could be distance. Uh, so this is one of the, perhaps the line of questioning of the defense lawyer, how far were you, how? And so note here, the distance law doesn't have to be a binary. It can also be a continuous variable for distance. And we can use psychological findings to fill in the numbers for the conditional probability table. In fact, there is a recent paper here that examined the connection between the effect of distance on face recognition and as one would expect, as the distance becomes greater, the hit rate, the hit rate of an eyewitness identification goes down and the false alarm rate goes up. So we can use this number in the conditional probability tables in this uh, continuous case as well. We can have more complex case. We can use these basic building blocks to build more complex case of undercutting information that is presented and elicited during cross-examination. So we can have a, a chain of inferences through various hypotheses, and then each one of these chain of inferences can be undercut by a particular kind of information, undercutting information. We can also make the model even more complex by saying that this undercutting information, let's say, bad visibility or a laboratory error is itself a hypothesis that could be under scrutiny, that could be under cross-examination maybe by the other party. And so we can treat it as a hypothesis that could be proven or disproven by providing uh, evidence. So here I, next to a node, we have an undercutting, hypo undercutting hypothesis and that we have evidence for that undercutting hypothesis. Uh, then the other piece is the rebutting part. So I'm not going to go to the rebutting part. So recall that rebutting evidence, subsidiary as rebutting evidence, is evidence that supports a hypothesis that is incompatible with the hypothesis initially put forward. The model here is also fairly simple. We have a piece of evidence, E1, that supports a hypothesis, H1. We have another piece of evidence, E2, that would be the rebutting evidence that supports a hypothesis incompatible with H1, H2. And then we have this arrow between H1 and H2 that is, uh, we can then define the probability distribution or put constraints on the probability distribution and ensure that these two hypotheses are incompatible. That is, they cannot be both true. So we can write this as a conditional probability that the probability of H2 condition on H1 is zero. There are other ways to do that. You can add maybe a constraints node in between the two hypotheses to, to make them incompatible. There, there are various ways of going about it and pros and cons for each one of them. But either way, once we do that and we put these constraints on the probability distribution, we can prove the fairly simple results, which we would expect that whenever we add Rebutting evidence to the stock of evidence, the probability of H1, our initial hypothesis goes down. So we can, we could prove the same result for undercutting evidence. So whenever we add rebutting evidence or undercutting evidence, the probability of our hypothesis goes down. But the way in which the probability goes down is different. The mechanism is different and capture that mechanism by the different causal structure of the two Bayesian networks. One for the rebutting case that you see here and one for the undercutting case that you saw before. We can play around with this model in, in various ways, make it more complicated and look at different possible variations. So I'm gonna give you a few examples, but I won't go into the detail just to get you a feel of things. So we can add the requirement that the two hypotheses are not only incompatible, not only exclusive, but they also exhaustive. So they cannot be both false, and they cannot be both true. So these are hypotheses that would be, Aristotle would say they are contradictory. They're not contrary, but they're contradictory. And once we do that, we put this extra constraint that they're both exclusive and exhaustive. Then adding the two pieces of evidence together, E1 and E2, where E2 is the rebutting evidence, 
gets us the result that the two pieces of evidence cancel each other out completely. So the probability of age, one, our initial hypothesis, once we update by both pieces of evidence, goes back to the prior probability of age one. We can rela relax the assumption of exhaustivity, so we can assume that the hypotheses are incompatible, but they're not exhaustive. So the probability, given that H1 is false, that H2 is true is less than one for some value in one, and we can explore all the different values. And we can see that there is an interesting connection between how close these hypotheses are to be contradictory, how close the hypotheses are to be exhausted, and the extent to which the rebutting hypothesis attacks the initial hypothesis H1. So the more incompatible the two hypotheses are, the closer they are to be fully exhaustive and exclusive, the stronger the attack of E2 in the rebutting evidence is on the initial hypothesis H1. Final possible playing around with the model. I haven't said anything so far about these two pieces of subsidiary evidence, E1 and E2, coming from the same witness. This could be two statements that come from two different sources, but it could also be two statements that come from the same source, the same witness. If that's the case, we might want to put an additional constraints on our network, which is a direct dependency between the two pieces of evidence. The reason for doing that is that witnesses might have a consistency bias in the sense that if they made an assertion and they provided that evidence E1 that supports hypothesis H1, they might be at this point much less inclined to provide a statement and information or evidence that is that supports a hypothesis that is inconsistent from the hypothesis that their previous statement, that their previous evidence that they provided support. And so they have a consistency bias. And we can play around with that and see what comes out if we put that additional constraint. I hope I have still a little bit of time. So I just want to conclude here back to the question of cross-examination as an engine for truth discovery. So Have we learned anything with this conceptual modeling to Bayesian net? Let's suppose that we think of cross-examination, as I've been suggested, as an engine for retrieving both undercutting and rebutting facts, as well as reinforcing facts. That's something I didn't talk about, but it's important to stress that during cross-examination, you might get information that weakens the other party's case, but also inadvertently information that strengthens the other party's case. So I call this reinforcing facts. So if we call all these subsidiary facts in various ways, we can then run or sketch the following argument for cross-examination as an engine discovery. Number one, the assessment of the property value, that's premise one, of the witness testimony presented at trial via the retrieval of these of relevant subsidiary facts is truth for use. So that would be one premise we need to defend. And number two, Cross-examination is the best method for identifying this relevant subsidiary fact. That's the second premise we need to defend. If we defend these two premises, and if they, they both hold, then I think we have a good case that cross-examination is, in fact, a good engine for the discovery of truth. Now, these two premises, however, at the same time, also suggest two ways in which cross-examination might go wrong. The first way is that this subsidiary fact that we elicit during cross-examination could be misjudged. We could give too much or too little weight for, to that. And here, perhaps, the modeling of cross-examination using Bayesian network can help us reduce that risk. But the second way in which cross-examination could go wrong and bring us further away from the truth is that we do not, we do not retrieve all subsidiary facts. We leave some out, maybe because the resources are unevenly allocated between the two parties. Now, if you want to know more about this, you can have a look at my recent paper, a probabilistic analysis of cross-examination using basic network. And if you want to have a larger framework of this use of probability for thinking about evidence and the trial, you can look at this uh, piece, Legal Probabilist, that was recently came out with Rafael Urbanek in the Central Encyclopedia 
of philosophy. It's freely available online. Thank you very much. And if you want to get in touch with me, you have my email there and my welcome questions and comments. Thank you.